Shardy party, shardy party on Art Smack, Art Smack, Art Smack. <gasps> Welcome back to Art Smack, episode two. I'm your host, Annie Taylor, and I'm here with my frenemy, Sherry Ngozian. And I have just come back from South Africa mm -hmm. where I underwent the Cape Town cleanse. Yeah. Which is goop certified mm -hmm. as detoxifying and purifying as you can imagine both up mm -hmm. and down and, down. and spiritually and one might say um, I came close to that tunnel of life <laughs> I believe in God once again <laughs> here I am survive I have to say to travel 30 hours to get somewhere to basically only be somewhere for I did the math it was like 42 hours that I was there and then fly 30 hours to get home disappointing traumatic <sighs> like I didn't get to do my NYU school trip like I you didn't, didn't do, solve the energy crisis I did not solve the uh South African energy crisis and I was I had this incredible playlist of galleries and artists and studios I was planning on visiting and I got to do one two three four and on the fourth one with my girls from Southern Guild, shout out to them. Love them so much, but they took me to a little restaurant where I had some fermented crushed cucumbers and I caught, I don't know, I salmonella from something within that meal. It was just, I couldn't stay. Yeah. No, I understand. Sounds like my trip to Mexico City. So. Yeah, but I felt like a quitter, you know, but like Matt was like, come home. No, like you everybody. were dying. Your blood pressure was 70 over 50. I don't think that's the time to appreciate art. I think that's the time to come home yeah. and rest Somebody and was well. giving me shit on, on Instagram about it. They're like, you're not painting the whole picture of the South African art scene. And I'm like, no, you're, 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 you're right. absolutely correct. I'm, I'm not in I'm, bed. I'm in a hospital room right now being saved by <laughs> sisters. That's what they call it. So they call it, I love this in South Africa, Cape Town, they call nurses sisters. sisters. I love but that. But even if the nurse is a man, wow. they're, cool. still, they're still progressive. A sister. I love it. I love, cause I was really confused cause I had a male nurse and they're like, Sisters, sisters coming in and I was like wait but that's mister and they're like no 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 it's the sister I love that that yeah. gives it a homey feeling yeah yeah and they like um sh shot me up with a lot of this drug called Phenergans okay which is like the old the world's oldest anti-nausea medication that like completely works but it makes you trip like does it I tripped my ass off and it, and like, I would get another shot like every eight hours. That explains some of the texts I was getting. Oh, no. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. What was I saying? Just some interesting thing. Lots of repetition, but we won't go into it. <laughs> oh, no. I was chalking it up to dehydration, Oh, I but know. it was a little bit more than that. Yeah. Oh God. That's embarrassing. No, it wasn't. It was for my enjoyment. <laughs> I'm really embarrassed right now. But anyways, I didn't like get to get you a present when I was in Cape Town. So I figured the next best thing I could do was no steal from yes. the first class cabin on Everest. So um, wow. I, I wanted to present you with I <laughs> am so touched. Viewers, I do not fly first or business. I am a strictly comfort plus girl on a day where I'm feeling rich. Thank Why you. So this up? is a treat for me. <laughs> <gasps> they give you pajamas. Oh wait, whoops, they're inside out. Hold on. Cause someone may have worn them. Someone may have worn them. I love a hand-me-down. <laughs> no, I, I, no, they are new. Look, they are new. I think wow. I tried one pair. <gasps> wait, and there's something else. I'm so spoiled. They give you like full bottles of Bulgari products, like guys, hundreds of dollars. Do you like it? I love it. Wait, I'm gonna put put this on. I don't want to get you guys. We're not sponsored. We're not sponsored for Bulgari, but, but we would, want to be. If you would like to sponsor us? I I welcome it. I'm not gonna stress. This is called Desiria. Sounds like whatever I caught in Cape Town, guys. 
It's actually the top is very like classy. It's like what I think Martha Stewart sleeps in. It's got that, what is it called? Like a cow towel neck or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And it says Emirates like it on the side. It says Emirates like subtly on the side. Here, let me, let me spray my nail. It's called Desiria. Desire, Desiria. Diarrhea. Desiria. It's appropriate for Cape Town. <laughs> Ooh. Do you like it? I am living the Emirates life. <laughs> that, that is as good as I could do as a gift from my trip. Uh, I accept better than anything else. So Ooh. I did get, oh, it does smell really it good. It smells really good. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. Good. I, I, I definitely, I was that person, like, when nobody was looking, like, the, the flight <laughs> attendants, I was going into the unoccupied <laughs> And stealing like the good snacks. I, I, mean, I so obviously don't fit in there. And I was stealing all the pajamas. I brought Matt home pajamas. I brought you pajamas. I have a pair of All right, of so we need a sleepover, the three of us. Lewis can, I don't know, sleep in something else. But we'll be there in our Emirates PJs doing a little photo shoot the, with the, the cats. And it was like, what size do you want your pajamas to be? I was like, large. And she was like, but they're like quite large. And I was like... Yeah, you know, like, that's fine. That's I just like it loose. <laughs> and then the man who's like in the, oh, I have funny, another funny story about this. But like another man who's in the cabin is like, no, no, ma'am. Like, I decline them all the time. Like, you need a small. And I'm like, I'm trying to get them for my fiance. I'm stealing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're ruining this for me. Yeah, like, stop, yeah. stop being so catering know, to me. Like, 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 give me what I, I want. I know you're helping, but just go away. Shut up. <laughs> they also have, like, white macadamia nuts, like, mm. covered in chocolate, like, in these, like, fancy jars. And I, like, was, and this, this is actually good service. And also, it's very game recognizes game. Like, the flight attendants, like, I, okay, I upgraded myself, you guys, because I, I almost goddamn died in Cape Town and I wanted to be as comfortable as possible on my 30 hour flight back home to America. But I felt like the flight attendants were a little like, Oh, she, she's not our normal (laughs) customer. She doesn't know what she's doing (laughs) up here. (laughs) So like when I, they saw that I was like taking all the things (laughs) with the other cabins, she did the flight attendant just went over and she was like, you can have as much as you want. It's not a secret. Yeah. You you can have, you can have as much as you want of any of this. She's like, would you like me to put some in your bag of like the white chocolate macadamia nuts? And I was like, and you're like with shame, like who could <laughs> scrounging through <laughs> your co like, your co flyer is like trash. So bad. I've been throwing up for like five days. I looked fucking crazy. I can't believe I was sending you repetitive texts. Okay, whoops. <laughs> anyway. And some fun videos. And we had a really good FaceTime call from the hospital. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which I loved. Which yeah. I loved. It's it, all fun. It, it was, it, yeah, it was just very unexpected. Like, I flew into Cape Town. And I went to, um, I stayed at this hotel called the Nelson, Be- it's a Belmont Hotel. Mm-hmm. And it's beautiful. It's like Barbie Palace. It's like fun. this beautiful, beautiful gardens, just like p- people playing piano, doing high tea, mm-hmm. like everyone's dressed up. Like mm-hmm. it's like a, a lovely place. And I was like, I'm going to stay for one night. And I, I came in, I dropped, I dropped my bags. Uh, I was with my friend Lily. And then we immediately got into a car and we hit like a bunch of galleries all at once. And so we did, we went to a gallery called what if the world. Oh Yeah which was very cool. It was a converted, uh, like car repair shop that they turned into so an art cool. gallery. They specialize in artists from all over Africa, but mm-hmm. a lot of South African artists. And then we saw Chris Soul's exhibition, which was cool. And then we went to Smack Gallery. And I, I just in general have enjoyed many of the painters. They have a, a great exhibition up now, but just in general, like I will, I'm drawn to a lot of the painters that they've chosen over the years. They used to show a friend of mine, Georgina Great Tricks, who mm-hmm. I love. She's not really a friend. It's more like I'm a fan and I've met her a few <laughs> times, so I'm calling her my friend, but you know. And then we went to Goodman Gallery. Okay. And they had an incredible exhibition as well. I should look, I should look up the name. Ravel Pillay is the name of the artist that they have on 
exhibition. Has this ever happened to you before? Have you ever like walked into a gallery and you thought like you were like very confident that you were looking at somebody else's, else's art? A hundred percent. Sometimes I've even said, said the name said out it, loud. I said it out loud mm-hmm. and I was corrected immediately. Okay. I was like, is this a Cl- Claire Tabaret show? Yes. And they're like, no, it's this African artist, Ravel Pillay. But I highly recommend that you guys check out these paintings. They're so amazing. So there was a large diaspora of people from India Mm -hmm. throughout South Africa's history. And they have also dealt with a lot of like issues with apartheid and segregation and um, being destabilized in terms of land ownership, Mm -hmm. property ownership. And so she went back to her grandfather's home that has fallen into disrepair because the government had taken it away from the yeah. family a long time ago and like repainted it. And it's, the paintings are so beautiful. And she painted photographs of like her old relatives and it was, it was really yeah. beautiful. Like it was probably the first painting show in a long time where I wanted to cry Aww. when I was looking at the work. It was it felt real. It didn't feel like a constructed, like, sob story that to make the art more interesting. Yeah. It felt like that was the healing that sort of was necessary generationally. That's great. Yeah, it was. It's And the paintings are incredible. Here, you should yeah, just let me see. take a look. But you can see kind of how I maybe thought they had a little oh, clear sure. tower. Right? Oh, they're beautiful. Then, but that doesn't detract from it, like you know, being interrelated. Gorgeous, right? I love this. I love I Never Forgot You. That's beautiful. Yeah, this is exceptional work. Which gallery was this? Goodman Gallery. Goodman Gallery. And then the next day was when I went to Southern Guild. Mm -hmm. So Yana, who gave me a tour, one of the directors, we were kind of having the debate about like what it is that they represent and sell. Is it it art? Is it... (laughs) design is Mm -hmm. it functional art is it functional design justine mahoney had this Mm -hmm. amazing like painting sculpture show and then there was this artist rich manisi who i have actually seen these works before Mm -hmm. he makes like oh my god this is so ominous so his name is rich manisi Mm -hmm. and he makes these rugs that he calls shedding skins. No. Let me see. They're pretty cool to look at, but what's really weird is that they're based off of this African God that they believe like vomited the universe into existence. So they like look like vomit, but it's really weird now that I think about it, that I saw these rugs. And then got immediately ill. And then I, two hours later, how weird is that? That is very weird. Maybe the spirit overtook you. They're, they're beautiful, though. They're beautiful. Like, it has a beautiful, beautiful vomit. Rob's yeah. like, wow. He's, like, super famous in There's, Africa. He's, like, rock star, designer, artist. Yeah, the, he's spectacular. That was kind of, very sadly, I didn't get to go to their... They, they have, like, a, an incredible museum. They get to go, saw the outside of it. And I was like, I'm going to go tomorrow. <laughs> like, tomorrow never came for me. Yeah, so it was just kind of, like, a weird slingshot of time and space. And I can remember parts of it, parts of it I can't. And it was just... It's an opportunity for you to go back moving forward if you want to make the 30-hour trek again, hopefully within a year or two. Yeah, I yeah. might need like a solid need, year yeah. to like naturally just yeah. forget. But you need about you need this. to go back and appreciate it it's, in a healthy way because there's so much to offer there and it's spectacular on so many levels. Truly, so. truly, and nature mm-hmm. is so in Cape Town. It's, it's and Stellenbosch. Like, have you ever been to Big Sur in California? Yeah, it's like Big Sur but bigger. Yeah, if you can imagine, just everything like Table Mountain, mm-hmm. like lush. Yeah. I, I absolutely love it there. Yeah. So, again, I, I'm sorry, you guys, that I could not represent fully the uh, South African art scene on my Instagram. It was just physically impossible. Mm-hmm. Do you want to share a little tidbit of gossip that you heard while you were there about how important it is to pay your artists? Yeah. 
you know, there is a practice that happens commonly in the art world within the mid, the like emerging to mid tier of art, art dealer, art galleries around the world, which is sometimes people are forced to like rob Peter to pay Paul mm -hmm. and like weigh, like, do we pay rent this month or mm -hmm. do we pay this artist? Or this do we month? do this fair? Yeah, exactly. Or do we do this fair or do we pay for shipping mm -hmm. this exhibition or whatever? And I was really disappointed to learn that one of the galleries that I visited doesn't like pay their artists. And it's not just one artist. It's like several. Mm -hmm. and, like, I don't feel like getting sued for slander. Yeah. Like this isn't my cross to bear to, mm -hmm. to solve this problem for anyone. But as somebody who has kind of worked in multiple positions across the art world, including being the person who at times was like, fuck overhead is so high yeah. and I need to pay this artist mm -hmm. their 50%. Like you just, you have to pay artists. Yeah. It's, it's non-negotiable. It's not acceptable not to like, if you think about how few seasons an mm -hmm. artist has to bring in revenue mm -hmm. at in, within like a traditional art gallery model, those times are so far and few, like one solo show, mm -hmm. two solo shows, if they're lucky, Maybe, there are a couple yeah. group shows here and there, like they work basically for long periods of time without seeing without, a mm -hmm. penny. So when they fair and square have their artwork exhibited and sold, you need to pay them within 30 days. Yeah. That it is 30 days from within the time mm -hmm. that you receive payment. Yeah. And I don't know if me saying this, it, like, I feel like I'm scolding the thin air because I'm sure the people that are guilty of these practices are like, yeah, but you don't know my situation. Yeah. But I also would say like, yeah, but imagine how awful, like your problems are different. Like your problems are like, oh, I need to spend this money to like wine and dine a client or yeah. get into another affair. And these artists are maybe like, where am I going to, to live? live? How am I going to eat? How? That your artists also have their own problems yeah. and artists. That's why it's so important. You need to understand contracts and contract negotiation contracts. and make sure you have contracts. It's really nice handshakes, word of mouth. Oh, we'll take care of you. But at the end of the day, you need legal protection. Yeah. So just always have everything mm -hmm. in writing. I mean, it is true that te technically like even a text message or an email can be a contract, which is why you should always be careful what you put in writing. Yeah. But like go the step further, work with chat GPT, mm -hmm. whatever. You don't have to always hire an attorney. But no. Have have something. Yeah. Have an outline, parameters, payment schedule, even if it is just and an email. And then have a docu signed. Exactly. Like co signed back and forth. And that's it. Yeah. Like just protect yourself mm -hmm. because it, it made me really sad to get all these dms when people saw me at this gallery being like you know they're really they don't take care gallery. of their artists like they don't pay people yeah. and i and i felt like i was put in a bad position because you know i'm sure for some of you listening you're like why don't you just like be cool and say who it is and call them out. But also it doesn't work like that. I don't want to open myself up to a lawsuit. Yeah. You know, getting sued for slander is a real thing. I also, I am not an attorney and I am not a police officer. Mm -hmm. Like those things, those people and those roles exist in society for a reason. Please seek out those systems for help. If you feel you've been a victim of these crimes, Unfortunately, I it is just not my place to mm -hmm. do it. But I will say that out of those galleries that I visited, one in particular, dozens of you know DMs and people very hurt and very upset because they feel actively wronged by this gallery. Yeah. And it put me in a bad position because I basically gave them free advertisement yeah. on my Instagram. And account. showed your support for them when yeah. they're not supporting the people that offers them this opportunity to yeah. live this way and work this way. So it's very upsetting. You know, I don't know why they're doing what they're doing, but I hope they can course um, correct and course correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and seriously, if you're an artist or it's a group of you that have gone through this, like there are strength in numbers, mm -hmm. gang up on that gallery together, yeah. pitch in for an attorney. A lot mm -hmm. of attorneys will take you on pro bono knowing that, you know, if money is collected on the other side of mm -hmm. a lawsuit, 
they'll they get a portion yeah. of that. So, mm-hmm. you know, there are a lot of ways to navigate that. And I wish everyone well in that situation. And it was just, it was an, it was sad to, to see it, but actually it happens everywhere. everywhere. It truly happens everywhere. Like I've known galleries in LA that have done it. Mm-hmm. I've known galleries in New York that have done it. Mm-hmm. I've, I, recently I was in India and some people told me about, you know, some corruption tales I mean, we're going to get into the whole Birkin gate and how mm-hmm. related it is to the art world in a minute. But I mean, again, I know that the idea of the art world being regulated seems imposs- a, impossible and supremely uncool. I-, I get it, you guys. Like I, when I hear it, I'm like rules, like the art world <laughs> needs rules. It sounds so yuck. It sounds so ick, but the reason so many people get taken advantage of and fucked over is yeah. because they're like, I want to live on the edge. I want to live in this world where like rules no. don't exist and rules don't Rules apply. are in place to protect you regardless of the environment that you're in. So mm-hmm. it's not cool to talk about them. It's an awkward conversation, but it's a necessary one. So just everyone do yourselves a favor. Make sure you have everything in writing. Yeah. Yeah. And should we move on to Birkengate? Let's talk about Birkengate. So I'll just read you like the AP, Mm -hmm. the AP news report. Tell me, tell me if this sounds familiar to you. Hermes lawsuit claims luxury retail retailer reserves its famed Birkin bags only for its biggest spenders. Obviously. Duh. Does this sound like? (laughs) Hermes is being targeted in a new lawsuit accusing the luxury retailer of selling its coveted Birkin handbags only to customers who have spent exorbitant amounts of money at the store on other goods. The proposed federal class action lawsuit, which was filed this week in San Francisco, alleges that Hermes is violating antitrust laws by making customers buy other goods in the store before being granted the privilege of buying a Birkin bag from Hermes. Birkin handbags, which are handcrafted leather by artisans in France, can cost tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars on the secondhand market and are seen on, you know, celebrities, including Jerry Kogosian. The handbags (laughs) can only be purchased in an Hermes store, not on its website, Mm -hmm. or you can buy it uh, on the secondary market, which is what I've done. Side note, because I wanted to bypass this bullshit because it's so offensive. And also... I get this rigmarole in like the art world constantly. However, the lawsuit claims the average customer can't just walk into an Hermes store, find a Birkin on display and buy it. Rather, customers that are deemed worthy will be shown a Birkin in a private room. This it's just like the art world. Weird. Like the art world. Hmm. Hermes Strange. sales associated are tasked with choosing customers that are qualified to buy Birkins according to the lawsuit. These sales associates are directed by defendants to only offer Birkin handbags to consumers who have established, oh my God, this is so funny, a sufficient purchase history or purchase profile with defendants, uh, ancillary products such as shoes, scarves, belts, jewelry, Mm -hmm. and home goods, the lawsuit states. The fact that you can file an antitrust lawsuit in the the fashion world is, again, going to be very different than the art world, which Mm -hmm. is completely opaque and you can't and non-transparent in any sense of the term but it is exactly that like it's the same thing as what, paying your dues at a gallery and buying emerging artists buying into their program mm-hmm. before you'll ever get offered a, whatever and you get a one-stop shop to say yes to that and then it's over they've moved on so, yeah yeah i mean and that is why so many people buy from auctions because mm-hmm. they're like i don't want to deal with that and I actually am curious about the math on like blue chip art in that sense. I mean, I, it, it's different too because the market can fluctuate mm-hmm. and actually people are buying works re- for like really for cheap now for dirt, nothing for nothing at auction. Yeah. Which is a way I wonder like long term, mm-hmm. what what is the smarter financial move to buy things at auction and you kind of do, you do pay a percentage for the auction house. And you're paying, it's secondary, which means there's something added onto whatever the primary price is and you're bidding against other people who potentially want the work, but you're potentially saving yourself money because maybe you didn't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on artwork you were never interested in with to begin with. And the headache of just going through that as well. 
jumping through the hoops, mm-hmm. going to the dinners, going to all the exhibitions, yeah. going and kissing ass at every single mm-hmm. art fair, kissing the ring and doing everything to yep. like show how in support how you are. In love you are with this piece. You can't live no, without with it. No, with their program. With their program. Sorry. The whole, the entire program. And it's so crazy. So a friend of mine DM'd me about Katya, I think her last name's is Kaczynska's article in Artnet about like, is this the end of the, mm-hmm. the art market bubble? And it is the end, I think, of a, of a certain bubble. bubble. Mm-hmm. It'll be back. Like, it always comes back. But he, my friend who texted me the article, he was like, he was like, I, I'm going through all the Hong Kong previews. Mm-hmm. And he's like, they're just sending sh- shit yeah. over to these fairs. And I'm like, of course they are. Because they're still, Asia is where they are either market testing Mm -hmm. or they're sending like B-level artworks that they know over, you know, buyers and collectors in Europe Mm -hmm. and the U.S. are less likely to spend high on Mm -hmm. because they want like those A++ works. So then. (laughs) Or it's just leftovers from freeze. Exactly. Yeah. And then they're like, and they're just trying to offload it Mm -hmm. in in Asia onto people who are, you know, trying to get into collecting and are basically going through this Birkin treatment, which is like, look, look at me. Like, I'm willing to spend X amount of dollars with you. Please take me seriously Mm -hmm. as a collector. I do love art. I do care about art. And then like these galleries, they play like long-term mind games on people. It's very manipulative. But it works. It works. Yeah. It works on certain people. It's crazy. We went ring shopping today. Like Mm -hmm. a lot of these luxury brands do the same thing where they vet you, they make you buy like entry level products Mm -hmm. and they'll like withhold like really nice things. And until you're like desperate and you're pining for it and you'll pull the trigger and pay any amount of money to have the thing. And it is like a very effective sales strategy for the uninformed buyer yeah. or for people that really care about status. So where I think the art world like differentiates a bit from like Hermes or Rolex is I really do think sometimes galleries look at the collector themselves and really care about who they've purchased and what other artists they are collecting and who they look at every day and why they're interested in this piece. I kind of feel like Hermes, if you do put in your dues, eventually you can get one. Same with Rolex. I don't think they care quite so much about the caliber of individual buying from them as say, I don't know, Hauser and Worth would. Yeah, but maybe, but also no, no offense to Hauser and Worth, but like whatever vetting system they're doing is bullshit too. Yeah. Because let me tell you, like, if you were to walk into a house or worth anywhere in the world right now and you're like, I want to buy a Charles Gaines, yeah. they'd, they'd be like, fuck off, get out of here. <laughs> or like, I want to buy a Mark Bradford. Yeah. Or what, you know, one, you pick one of their, um, Amy Sherald, like mm-hmm. one of their superstars. No. For sure, no. They would tell you to fuck off and like maybe sell you a Nicholas party in mm-hmm. five years. And they make it seem like they are selling to like these art patron saints Mm -hmm. who are either only an institution or like these people who are buying generational Mm -hmm. art collections and it will be passed on to their children Mm -hmm. yo every auction season i see their superstars yeah in the auction and i don't i guess they're not making these mega collectors sign like um non-resale agreements because like the work is like a year and a half old and it's already already an auction yeah so, like, I don't believe, like, this this vetting system that, like, mm-hmm. allegedly has been created in the art world, it's not real. Yeah. And it, it's only real, like, I don't know how to say this, like, it's only real for the people they want to bully. Mm-hmm. It's not real <laughs> for, like, at for a anyone. certain yeah. level. I, okay, I follow a lot of these, like, secret tip websites on yeah. how to buy Birkins. There's, like, or not websites, or Instagram accounts, like, purse box and, like, mm-hmm. everything, and they, like... It's an anonymous account, okay. and this lady, like, flies around the world and buys bags, and she teaches people how to do it, how to, like, game the system. And it's, like, really insane because the art world has the same thing. They send in proxies mm-hmm. who basically have to go in with scripts, and, th- and this lady will tell you, like, this is what you go in. These are the things you have to say. 
you dress this way, like signal, like wear your Twillies, wear your Hermes earrings, yeah. like signal, and then like get into a conversation. And then at this point in the conversation, ask if there's a bag in the back and can you be shown it? And like she, this lady had like basically come up with a formula. And so people would like comment, like it worked for me. Oh no, it didn't work. And she'd be like, all right, we're moving the strategy away from Paris to this Hermes. And like, it was this whole wow. grift of like, just to get these bags. And is that even a grift though? Or is that? No, it's not. Like, it's just yeah. like people, I mean, that's why I opted out of it. Like I do like Hermes for mm-hmm. many reasons, mainly because I'm vain and it's an H and I, my name is Hildy. So it is my, you know, my anagram or whatever. And so I've just always been attracted attract to the brand. Mm-hmm. And I like the Birkin bag. I like the Kelly bag. I think they're chic and they're cool timeless. and timeless yeah. and whatever. I'm, I don't know why I feel like I have to explain why. Why, I get, I just, why Birkins are cool. I, yeah. I just like them. But anyway, I, I went through the process of like trying to play by their rules mm-hmm. like a couple of years ago. And I did like, I bought the blanket. I bought the earrings, a necklace. I bought a bunch of twillies. Mm-hmm. I bought a bunch of cuffs, you know? Yeah. Then I find out from these motherfuckers. Oh, well the Hermes in Europe is in a different system than in Hermes in America. Mm-hmm. And if your fiance bought something for you, it doesn't go under your profile. Nope. And the one in St. Bart's is all like it. It's also and so I was like, oh, so I did all that for nothing. For nothing, yeah. Unless it's from the same sales associate at the same store, always under your name, it doesn't count, and you still have to spend upward of thirty thousand yeah. dollars. So I just was like, fuck this, and I went on first dibs. Goodbye, and I and I'll, and also I would never like buy probably buy another bag from them, yeah. but like. I was just really like mad that yeah, I. Yeah, it's a, it's frustrating. But anyway, I mean, imagine I know so many art collectors that have this feeling and have this sentiment, and they're all laughing at. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I can't tell you how many DMs and texts I get every day from people being like, "LOL, X gallery that ignored me for years, mm-hmm. treated me like shit, wouldn't sell me anything. They are." begging me right now to, to take mm-hmm. their prime artists mm-hmm. like I can buy anything I want right now must feel good and I'm like yeah it must be fun but even still they're like yeah but they're trying to like jerk me around and make me pay prices like it's still two years ago and like there's a lot of buyer's remorse mm-hmm. from when people were buying PDF, Via PDF yeah because whoops those paintings showed up and surprise surprise they don't them- look photograph like better yeah. than they actually were and there's a lot of people with a lot of glut I guess mm-hmm. which takes us to Katya's article the one thing I think is sort of funny it's not a soft landing contemporary art prices come crashing down this is the end it's not the end but it is the end of an era yeah. for sure and it's also the end of an era for like trendy trendy figurative painting mm-hmm. I think the cream is going to be siphoned off the top. Mm-hmm. Like we've seen, like the, there will be greats from, you know, the last 10, 10 years yeah. that really nailed it. But a lot of that, like, portraiture is going to fall all right off. Yeah. It's, it, it's going to fall off. I it, mean, you look at Emmanuel Taku's painting, Sisters in Pink, which sold, let's see, it sold for, Hundred and eighty nine thousand dollars in twenty twenty one, and it just sold for eight thousand dollars. That's oh. rough. Yeah, yeah. Somebody bought at the top of the market. Mm-hmm. She says in the article, Matt actually wrote this incredible article that's on gagosian.com. If you're a subscriber, you can read it. Uh, like, is a fine art collection an on asset? Like, is it a good asset? Mm-hmm. It basically. There have been people who have thoroughly documented this over long periods mm-hmm. of time, 30 plus years. And because our collections are such illiquid assets mm-hmm. and are so subject to whatever is happening in the rest of the world yeah. and the rest of the economy, you, you rarely know like what you actually have. And it's such an expensive thing to maintain. 
an art advisor in the article is quoted as saying, if you are lucky and if you buy smartly, the advisor likes to remind clients one of the 10 things mm -hmm. in 20 years will pay several times over yeah. and will pay for the rest of your art collection that might be worth to next to nothing. Yeah. And she says, there are plenty of cautionary tales, uh, zombie for formalism, mm -hmm. Rudolf Stingle, Wade Guyton, mm -hmm. whose markets suffered in the aftermath of the indigo Fulbrick fraud. Galleries work hard to create the Im imp Im imprimature, I don't know what that word means, of value by building up their brands and placing prized artworks in prestigious collections, museums, settings, and biennials. An entire ecosystem is there to reinforce the belief that the art goes, goes up. up. Yeah. It is very transparent in showing that this is a racket and you really should buy, buy art. art that you love because it's not an investment unless you're getting a hot tip, like, I don't know, Salvador Mundi, you found at a pawn shop for a thousand dollars and you're about to sell it for 450 million. That doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, so buy art that you like and you want to live with and look at that inspires you. Yeah. You know, is creative, makes you want to learn more. Yeah. Don't do it solely for the investment. The investment is fourth on the list. Right. Which brings me to, I mean, I, I, I read this in the car on the way to come see you. I was not driving. <laughs> Um, Good. <laughs> and I was like ranting out loud to Matt about this, but this is why, again, like another uncool belief that I have cultivated over the last couple of years is this is why I believe the art market needs to be like all the prices need to be brought way down. Mm -hmm. And if somebody can afford a Louis Vuitton bag, which I don't know, $4,000, I don't know, I don't know. something, six, something four like to $6,000, yeah. like that same person should one for one at minimum have a real painting in their house for every Louis Vuitton bag or pair of shoes they have, right? Yeah. Like in a normal world, that would be the case because art is more important than handbags and shoes. But nonetheless, I quite often meet very wealthy people mm -hmm. who have extensive handbag and shoe collections who think art is out of their league. Yeah. And it's crazy because I know too many fucking mm -hmm. hungry artists who are trapped, you know, it, living in squalor, mm -hmm. barely paying back their student loans, not able to start families, not able to pay mm -hmm. for health insurance, et cetera, et cetera, in living in squalid conditions because they're trapped in some weird cycle that is feast or famine. -y yeah. And is like either work has to be sold at hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of dollars, or it's like weird and chuggy and cringe yeah. to sell art for a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars, three thousand dollars, and and I'm sorry. In protection of my art family, I like beg of people to think differently mm -hmm. about the way that art is is priced. Yeah, price it so it fucking flies out the door. Yeah. And so that real people can, can get enjoy it. and make because it accessible. I can assure you, these people promising it's going in to institutions or whatever, it's not. It's yeah. going into storage mm -hmm. or it's going to be flipped at auction. Yeah, in a year. So if you're lucky, the statistics of that even happening mm -hmm. are like if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And the statistics of a work going to auction more than once are like if you're yeah. lucky. So it, it, it's really like it, it's so frustrating for me for artists for to watch this and i i have friends as well who have all the nice bags and have beautiful homes and then i i go to their houses and the art you know it's nice prints and whatever but they're not investing in any art but it's because they don't understand this art world art world is alienating they go to galleries they don't understand this art speak they don't understand the text on the wall they don't understand the context behind the work because they don't have formal training so i can understand maybe how that's an area that they wouldn't feel comfortable diving into and spending so much money. But then I say to that, learn about an artist, buy from the artist directly, learn about the artist, learn about the work, learn about what motivates them and get involved on the ground level. If you're tired of this hierarchical nonsense, bypass mm -hmm. the gallery and find a young emerging oh artist God, that you like. We're going to want to murder you for saying that. Sorry, I'm, no, I mean, that's fine. That's your opinion. I, I do believe that there are galleries that, preserve the ability for an artist to produce long term. Yeah. Those those galleries are far and few between. Mm -hmm. And 
there are a lot of different buying opportunities, we could say, for you to support an artist yeah. and to support communities. And for your for an art collection to be authentic and reflect like something that I think is like very in vogue, like to reflect back like the world in which yep. you live, mm-hmm. which means like Buying from art artists, it, like a community that you are somewhat supplanted into is very important and is actually not as hard as like flying around the world to add all the, to all these like international art fairs and trying to get your hands on like trophies, yeah. status symbols. Mm-hmm. And like to the people who can just buy on like the ultra blue chip level mm-hmm. at all times, like God bless you. Like it. This isn't directed at, like, people who are super rich, who are doing super rich people things. Yeah. But it always shocks me that every other industry, design, fashion, everyone else has managed to version and tier their industry to make things accessible Mm -hmm. to different socioeconomic groups in the world. And it is only the art world that really seems set on alienating itself from everyone but rich people, which is the greatest irony to me that most artwork is criticizing Mm -hmm. systems that are perpetuated by these Mm ultra-rich people who are buying their work. And it it, it always shocks me when I meet, like, the most, quote-unquote, radical, like fuck capitalism, like whatever type of artist. And they're like at a fancy Mm -hmm. Michelin star restaurant surrounded Mm -hmm. by millionaires and billionaires who are kissing their asses. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, are you guys the same thing? Like, is your criticism real? Is this like some dominatrix relationship that you're involved in where like you putting down the rich people makes the rich people feel bad and in turn buy from you? And is is your critique effective at all if like you break bread with them on a regular basis? Like, no. I'm not sure. I don't know. Or maybe that just is the win. Like a dominatrix. Like I take money from. From these people who I'm making fun of in my work or commenting on. Yeah, maybe it is a win for them. But it, but you know what? That doesn't work for the vast majority of artists. The va- and I don't think the vast majority of artists are making art to make other people feel bad. No, I don't think so. They're they're doing it. They're putting a part of their soul on this paper, this canvas, this sculpture. You know, it's your inner psyche that's coming out. It's a self portrait of who you are. I don't think most of them go into it with such a cynical idea. No. So. For those people, I mean, I, I wish I could wave a magic wand and and I, I've, I've been predicting this for a while. Actually, I saw Art News like posted something about like the way they creating a, a world. And, you know, when I was studying LVMH's like business model a few months ago, they're talking very much about world building and mm-hmm. using artists to like build these worlds for these brands to mm-hmm. exist. So it's not like, it's not like, I feel like 10, 15 years ago, people were always talking about like branding and brand strategy. Mm -hmm. Now these fashion houses have shifted into what they're calling world building, kind of like video games, the Marvel universe, like that, you know, that Mm -hmm. whole thing where they're like, oh, let's, let's take the genesis of like ideas from artists and then expand on these worlds because also people are now paying more for experiences to like go outside of their house, which is wild. And, like, they're paying for these, like, meta-narrated universes that artists are creating and contributing to via these brands. And that will open up, actually, other income streams Mm -hmm. and revenues for artists. But I think there's something to be learned here, and I can't say it exactly in this moment and be super concise. But basically, like, it needs to become cool To make art more affordable. Yeah. And it needs to be chic somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't know who can pull that off. Like, there needs to be, like, the CB2 of art. Of art, yeah. Which, like, I like a lot of things at CB2. I think it's pretty nice, you know? Well, what about, like, online platforms like Tapan or Saatchi or places like that? Yeah, I mean, they they have been going for a while, but Mm -hmm. are they cool? No. No, they're not cool. They're not cool. And I don't know why. Yeah. Because 
it, it's so crazy. Like some of the galleries that I know people criticize the most, I'm not going to say who, but like the big evils, we'll just call them the big evil mega galleries and leave it That's at not that. very nice. <laughs> like, and people don't even like the, a lot of their art. Like mm-hmm. people talk so much smack, but their openings are packed. Mm-hmm. People are carrying around their tote bags, yeah. giving them free marketing. And all they can talk about is how like overpriced their, their artists are and this and that. And I'm like, you are, you are doing all of, you know, a hater is a fan and you are doing free marketing mm-hmm. for them by like continuing to cast this spell that like they are g- great because they are expensive mm-hmm. and they are exclusive. Yeah. And by perpetuating that belief, you put that into the universe mm-hmm. and then people believe it. Yeah. Like sometimes I walk around like Basel and I see these crazy price tags of these pieces and there's so much hype around them and I'm not really understanding the piece. And I'm thinking like, if I saw this piece at scope, would I still think it needed to carry this price the tag? The scope test. The scope test. Wow. That's that's, that's, an, that's, a, that's our new thing. Okay. And sometimes I'm like, no, they don't pass the scope test. But if you're telling me this thing is worth $75,000 or $250,000. Yeah. Okay. Then it has to be, but yeah. it looked. What about when we were in LA and we went to Hauser and Worth mm-hmm. and we went to that Pat Steer show Yeah. and they're like really beautiful abstract mm-hmm. paintings starting so, price $700,000. We were, we guessed $120,000 and we were like, okay, that seems reasonable. Yeah. Let's do some Googling. Yeah. I mean, we not reasonable. Like we were going to buy it. No, but but like, like, okay, seems to make sense for Hauser and this yeah. artist. And uh, no, 750 to $900,000. Yeah. Starting mm-hmm. again. Like I do, uh, I do understand that there's always going to be the the Plutonian ideal Mm -hmm. of everything, the greatest, highest essence of everything must always exist. And Mm -hmm. that does and should exist in art, but there's a lot of art that ain't it. Yeah. And they are still trying to charge as much money Mm -hmm. as they can. And I, Oh, I, I use this quote a lot, but there's some saying, I don't even remember where I heard it, but it was basically like, if your fans show up in a limousine, you will leave in a taxi. But if your fans show up in a taxi, you will leave in a limousine. And I think it is basically just about a numbers game, Mm -hmm. right? Is it better to sell 10 paintings for $10,000 or is it better to sell 20,000 paintings for $10? Yeah. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but if, if you're also, if your goal in your art practice is to reach as many people as possible, possible, then make your price points more accessible, but also you need to live and you want the prestige of those high price tags. You know what? Having this conversation, it is making me, and I'm going to, I kind of like hate myself for what I'm about to say right now, but like, it does make me understand why supreme (laughs) like did something very cool Mm -hmm. and very like I I mean I think the supreme magic that time has passed Mm -hmm. that like hype moment where I could be wrong but like they did do something and they did create like desirable art and design objects at a point Mm -hmm. that people could come would queue up around the block to get and then in turn, like secondary markets were created mm-hmm. and like it really became a culture for a long time. Yeah. I never was like into it, but now that I'm like saying this, I'm like, wow, I should have maybe been like a little kinder to, to them. them. Yeah. But again, it still does make me cringe yeah. a little, a right? Bit. Because the art snob in me does not allow me Like I'm saying all of this and I believe it. So then, but you're an artist. So how do you then go about pricing your work? So, I mean, I, because I'm a multimedia Mm cross-disciplinary artist, (laughs) um, I, I, I have like a different, like, I have like a menu of how I charge. So like how I charge for sort of what could be considered like things that exist on my online platforms Mm -hmm. 
or collaborations with different brands or whatever, which I still consider art, those things will be priced differently versus receiving my newsletter, which Mm -hmm. is $30 a month if you're VIP and $10 a month if you're a premium subscriber. Mm -hmm. That's a revenue stream for me. Having uh, sponsors on the podcast, that's a revenue stream for me. And when I make physical artworks, Mm -hmm. I do something that I've never heard of another artist doing, which is I work in a third uh, way. Let me explain Explain, this to you guys. Okay. So I think what most artists do is they work in their studio. They're like a little, a little factory, right? They work, 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 work. And then they hope, wish and pray, or maybe they have some pre-existing relationship with the gallery that they're going to get a show. And then the gallery's job is to work, 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 Mm -hmm. sell their work. And then they split that 50%. Mm -hmm. I don't do that because I do not believe in taking on that amount of financial risk for something that isn't a sure thing. Yeah. So what I do, and I'm like, I, I feel like it's okay to be open about this because maybe what I do will work for other artists is I treat whatever gallery or whichever company I'm working with, I treat them like a fair partner in a business venture. Mm-hmm. And so what I say is when the object is sold, they receive two thirds of the sale okay, and I receive a third of the sale, but I price the work based on how much it costs for me to make the work. Okay. So for example, if a sculpture is $40,000 to create, mm-hmm. then the sculpture must be sold for four t- or, or three times mm-hmm. $40,000, $40, which is $120,000, mm-hmm. which means the commissioning body or the gallery I'm working with must put that upfront capital okay, and they make that back in the sale. Plus they make a third and I make my guaranteed third. Okay. And the reason I do this is twofold. I do it because I don't think that I need to be asked to make any further financial sacrifice. I've already made enough financial mm-hmm. sacrifice for my art career. Yeah. But I also think, it is a financial incentivization for them to figure out how to sell it. Do you think that's a model that's applicable to other artists? Yeah, though? totally. Okay. Maybe not, maybe not everyone, mm-hmm. but I think there's actually, I mean, there, there's other artists that like maybe their gallery pays for their studio yeah. or, and materials, and the materials yeah. or something mm-hmm. like that. Like I have structured it, you know, and I don't think that like coming out of the gate, every single artist can just go to someone and say like, this is how I want to structure this deal. Mm-hmm. But this is what I have personally felt is the safest and best way for me to maneuver selling art at larger numbers mm-hmm. is I can't like, no offense to anyone, but I cannot be just like guaranteed that some senior director or whatever, who's overworked and underpaid is like going to prioritize selling my work they get access to my platform. Mm-hmm. I'm an all-in type of person. I will do, you know, talks, live mm-hmm. appearances, host big parties. Like I will do anything and everything to ensure that there is a culture around the artwork, yeah. that it is meaningful. Like I I do my part, but I can't just rely, speaking about like a handshake. Yeah. I can't just like go and make a sculpture that costs $40,000 yeah. And hope and pray that, you know, the senior director who's Mm -hmm. flying to an art fair every five minutes and trying to sell all these things, it cannot be guaranteed to me that that artwork will be sold. But I fucking guarantee you, if they're financially incentivized by taking such a big loss, Mm -hmm. they will sell it. So that's all I'm saying, guys. Like, as artists, you know, you can, like, you don't have to be the victim in these situations can find a way that works for you. Yeah. Yeah. And it has worked for me. And and the blessing in all of this is it has enabled me to take bigger strides Mm -hmm. to make more complicated, more expensive, inherent to the materials that I'm working with, more interesting works because I have a, you know, financial footing. Whereas before when I was younger and I was making work, a lot of times I was 
making a lot of shortcuts with materials and things because I just didn't have the money yeah. at the time. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a good business person mm-hmm. and being an artist. No, you have to be both. <laughs> or find someone who can help you do the business. Side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, find someone who can do it. Find that. a mat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, shall we talk about the Whitney Miami? Guy? Which I have not seen, but dear Annie Taylor has. I went. I have some thoughts. My question for you off the bat is, who are these biennials for? (laughs) Who who, who are they for? I know. Because it's not for the public. It's just for... It's not for America. It's not for America. It's like, I was walking around. I'm like, who is understanding what they are seeing? Like, Wait, I have to tell you. Somebody, because I want to get into how... I didn't go see the show, but I was making fun of the press release today. Because, of course, I like read it. Just to... Just to double check that mm-hmm. they threw in as much art speak and intersection of, course. of and blah, blah, blah. And somebody accused me of being anti-intellectual. <laughs> and I was like... Thank you. I was like, no, I mean, maybe, LOL. But also, like, it's okay to admit that, like, most of this art is a lot of hot air. Yeah. Like... That's fine to say. Is it not? Or just everything... Not all, not all art is serious. No. If all art was fucking serious, it would not be fun. Yeah. And also, where is the humor? They literally, I think, tried to say somewhere in the press release that there was humor embedded in the exhibition. Well, the one piece, I, or the three pieces that I found had humor were Mary Lovelace O'Neill's work, where these like, kind of monumental, bold, like brave paintings, and... She's an activist in the civil rights movement. So this was kind of like a dispersion from her work. She had seen a few whales off the coast of San Francisco, I guess, having sex and was so moved by like how the water was moving and thinking about it that she drew these like very poignant pieces. There's just so much raw motion and bold color. They're great. So I found humor in that, but... No, nothing else is funny to me about the entire exhibition. I did laugh at the Williams piece, the crumbling north facade of the White House with yeah. the upside down flag where it's just like, guys, nuance is dead. We understand America's going through a rough patch. But like, I'm sorry, that's just not what I want from my political art. I want like the political art to engage with me and make the viewer question, okay, I see this issue too. How can I help? Or what steps are is this artist or this community doing to make the situation better? Just putting a crumbling White House yeah. with an upside down flag. I'm sorry. I just, I didn't. Yeah. Literally after flying for 30 hours and getting home, that's like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to watch The Zone of Interest, which is um, a new movie that is a work of art. Mm-hmm. Truly, 100, it it is so amazing, but it is about the household and the physical home of the man who ran Auschwitz Mm -hmm. and like his wife and their many children and the the housekeepers that work for them and whatever. And like, there was this incredible garden and, you know, fountains and a dog and a greenhouse and like the house was very kept and orderly. And they never show, like, the atrocities Mm -hmm. that we all know happened at Auschwitz. But you could see these, like, very idyllic images of, I mean, Matt was laughing at me because I was like, this kind of, with a different, like, filter, this could look like a Wes Anderson film. Yeah, okay. You know, because I'm like, it's it's like a lot of, like, patina Mm and pinks and, and antlers and, you know, we know the Germans love order and cleanliness. Mm-hmm. And so you were like looking at all these very quaint, beautiful domestic images and like a healthy family. But then like in the background, you just see like barbed wire or you hear like people being shot yeah. or or the dogs, but you never actually see, see it. it. Mm-hmm. You know, you see the train going by with the smoke or like at night you see like the furnace you know, burning. Yeah. And, and so it was really like nuanced and incredible. And I don't think, because it's not like a narrative film where I don't mm-hmm. think I'm like spoiler, spoiler, spoil, spoiling anything. Yeah. 
I love the movie so much because the very end of the movie, Mm -hmm. because they only show like from the inside of this like compound throughout the entire movie, basically. And at the end of it, they only show, it makes me very emotional. um, They only show the Holocaust museum that exists and they show people who get up every single day to clean it and like polish it and to like make sure that it, remains Mm -hmm. and stays like prescient in our minds that like as humans we are capable of this this monstrosity yeah and so there's just like interesting like you're in the 40s you're looking at this like beautiful garden and these healthy nazi children and their parents and like they're eating pies and like whatever and you're seeing the horrible things and then you switch and it's just the last five minutes it's like you're watching people like polish the windows and behind the windows are thousands of shoes or mm-hmm. like, you know, so it was just, it's a masterpiece. It's, mm-hmm. it's so good. Like I really recommend people watch it, but talk about like nuance. Yeah. You never once see so, it. Yeah. You never see it, but you, I you feel, feel it. it. Yeah. No, that's on my to watch list. Yeah. Yeah. So was there anything else that you liked at the Whitney Biennial? J. Fan, I think that's his name, had these beautiful 3D printed pieces kind of of his vertebrae, of his hips, his knees, that he would mold together with um, hand-blown glass. Okay. And they're very organic, they're engaging, and they're, they're kind of eerie. And there were little like holes through the walls in which you could engage with them and and make them feel like they're, you know, living, breathing things, mm-hmm. which I, I thought were great. And then there was Mavis, who say had these large scale canvas works. She's originally from Jamaica. She moved to New York and she would draw the like concrete and the architecture and just the how the city slowly kind of fell into decay and how the architecture would crumble around around the city, but then also would Where be she rebuilt. Where from, in Jamaica? No, from here, oh, when she moved here. to the city. Oh, okay. And I liked her her pieces as well. But besides that, I just, I don't know, I was I left wanting a yeah. little more. Because it touched on so many great, like, political ideas, but they just were not articulated enough for, I think, a regular person to understand just looking at the work, what is this supposed to be talking to me about? Yeah. And then you go to the text, and again, it's just so art speaky yeah. that you walk away, I guess, wanting to have understood it a bit more. Yeah, there has definitely been a vibe. Remember the vibe shift? It, and this vibe shift happened before the vibe shift. But there was a time when I felt I would go to an art exhibition, a biennial, an art fair. And I didn't always feel like the artists and the curators were trying to make me have a bad time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's this trend now that like the more depressing Mm -hmm. and the more bleak you and hopeless, you can like paint a picture and like, extract all humor, Mm -hmm. extract any joy. Mm -hmm. God forbid you have any fucking joy in your life right now. Yeah. Or like you're happy Mm -hmm. or or grateful. Like, I I mean, you got it. I'm sure somebody's going to, I mean, I feel like I could be like, um, compared to like, like the art world's like Fox news right now. My God. Are you Tucker Carlson? I'm Tucker Carlson. (laughs) But like, if you've ever been to like many other places in the world, while America has incredible flaws, we are also greatly privileged to live here. Yeah, of course. Because there are much, much, much more dire countries to mm-hmm. be from. And I'm not saying I want to go to a pro-America art fair, but that would be funny if you were to go back into contemporary <laughs> art because obviously we know that would be a hilarious show. But like this thing that like, it's this addicted to outrage mm-hmm. universe that we live in where like part of the reason I love art and I fell in love with art is because it is an escape mm-hmm. and it is an opportunity to like live in parallel universes where magic is possible, mm-hmm. laughter, joy, because yeah, the world is fucking bleak, but like I don't need to live in the bleak world and then only ever go see bleak, bleak shows. art. Yeah. 
And there's this weird thing where I feel like art doesn't think of, that it can be smart. Mm-hmm. And unless, also be enjoyable. And, yeah. and be enjoyable yeah. at the same time. And that's a weird thing to mm-hmm. me because I don't think that's true. Like one of my favorite artists was one of my teachers in art school, George Kuchar. He's the king of the eight millimeter underground cinema. He passed away, unfortunately, about eight years ago, but he very much inspired John Waters and like all these amazing filmmakers. His eight millimeter films, and and he and also he made video and he, he worked into, into his 70s. They they were sad, but they were so poetic, mm-hmm. so full of joy, so charming, yeah, so full of like love mm-hmm. and just all of the things that, I mean, when I was a young baby artist mm-hmm. made me fairly confident that this is the thing I wanted to do for the rest of yeah. my life. And I have not seen, I, we should go maybe this yeah. week to the Whitney Biennial. Sorry, I'll make you suffer through it again. I can, I can suffer through it again. But like, I certainly felt that way at the last Venice Biennale mm-hmm. where I was like, this is just an exercise in like torture yeah. for the viewer. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Self-flagellation. And this like if for that show was like feminism, surrealism, and dystopianism. And mm-hmm. I was like, my God, like my version of feminism doesn't involve dystopianism. No. But like these things, and 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 therefore allow me to get to the art speakiness. It's not it's not even that bad of the of the press release. But the 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 press release, when I read this, I was like flabbergasted. The 81st edition of the Whitney Biennial, the longest running survey of contemporary art in the United States, features 71 artists and collectives grappling with many of today's most pressing pressing issues. Okay. The biennial is like being inside a dissonant chorus. Okay. LOL to that. I usually don't opt into going to a dissonant chorus <laughs> like in my spare time, but okay. It's a little self-flagellation. Let's go. I'm not above criticism. As participating artist, Legia Lewis, I hope I pronounced that correctly, described it, a provocative yet intimate experience of distinct and disparate voices that collectively probe the cracks and fissures of the unfolding moment. Okay, like that could be any art show at any time, but fine, I'll pass. The exhibition subtitle, which I think is a Missed opportunity is mm-hmm. such a good title, even better than the real thing. Ready for the fun part? This is this is the Tucker Carlson ultra conflation moment of this whole press release. Just I want you guys to listen to this. Try if you can to see how the writer of this press release started with one thought and then goes to thought three, four, five, and six. Ready? Even better than the real thing acknowledges that artificial intelligence, and they put in parentheses AI, AI just so you uh, know, just so yeah, <laughs> is complicating our understanding of what is real. And rhetoric around gender and authenticity is being used politically and legally to perpetuate transphobia and restrict bodily autonomy. These developments are part of a long history of deeming people of marginalized race, gender, and ability as subhuman less than real. In making this exhibition, we committed to amplifying the voices of artists who are confronting these legacies and to providing a space where difficult ideas can be engaged and considered. So you are telling me this is an exhibition about all the problems in the world from every single perspective possible and we're going to somehow make it coherent and make it relatable to a public a, a, a public, wide audience yeah a wide odd i i don't think so no I, I you could have picked one of those things mm-hmm. and also i just love the idea of like better than the real thing like i mean i kind of like better than the real thing maybe you could look at it more like this is the artist's version of what they are going through. World is happening around them, but each person has their own real experience. So that's how I kind of interpreted the title. Mm-hmm. But I didn't I didn't appreciate how the first line after explaining what this was talks about acknowledging that AI is... But how is AI... AI and then there's only one work involving AI in the entire exhibition. Yeah, but Okay, wait, just let's try to follow it. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm dead serious. It acknowledges that artificial intelligence... 
is complicating our understanding of what is real. That's true. Fair. Okay. And rhetoric around how is AI complicating the rhetoric around gender and authenticity? Also, authenticity is a very large construct mm-hmm. and gender and authenticity. How is AI complicating our understanding of gender. what is real and rhetoric around gender and authenticity is being used politically? This is a run on sentence and legally to perpetuate transphobia and respect and restrict bodily autonomy. That is a lot. Yeah. That is a, it's like AI wrote that. Yeah. Like it, it doesn't, you know what this reminds me of, you know, like infomercials where it's like, do you have trouble taking out Tupperware? Mm-hmm. And somebody like reaches for one thing and, and like, like it everything falls, falls down. They're like, them. Oh. they're like, do you have a hard time wrapping yourself up in a blanket? And they're like, <laughs> you know, and then they're like, buy our product for idiots. Yeah. Like literally when I read this, I'm like, Wow, so you're telling me the world is hard mm-hmm. and it is complicated from many, many perspectives. Yeah. And but you're gonna like super speed this up. It has nothing to do with AI. That was just a, yeah. that was a complete completion. That was an SEO, mm-hmm. like search engine analytics, like mm-hmm. word drop to like somehow make this about artificial intelligence. I don't think artificial intelligence is what is being used to legally perpetuate transphobia and restrict bodily autonomy. How is AI doing that? It's not. And did you see any, I'm serious. Did you see any artwork that was about AI restricting bodily autonomy? No, I mean, there was one work of AI. It had nothing to do with bodily autonomy, to my understanding. What was that? What was the AI work? So these works by Holly... Hair, hair and Dawn, sorry, I miss said that, and Matt Dryhurst are part of the project focused on training the data behind artificial intelligence, AI again, models, opening new possibilities for its use. Holly Herndon is not just a person. The name also designates a distinctive internet presence, a female character with white skin, red hair, blood cunt side bags, side bang, sorry, and bright blue eyes. Herndon has become well-known in the music and digital art worlds to the point where when someone types the words Holly Herndon into a text-to-image AI program like Dolly or Stable Diffusion, the prompts generate an image with some, with some of the characteristics of Holly, the character. Okay. Okay. That's, that's just more like somebody playing with the technology. With, yeah. But again, I, I just want to say, for the record... Do I have a problem about art exhibitions that talk about deal with ideas such as transphobia and maybe systems that restrict, I don't really know what bodily autonomy means exactly in this context, but no, don't have a problem. But I do have a problem with this rapid conflation Mm -hmm. and like trying to make this, trying to say that this art exhibition is about anything when really I, I think it's a group of curators, mm-hmm. right? That come it's together. Two. It's two curators. Yeah. And really they're just like, I just wish it could be a little more honest. Mm-hmm. Like maybe the curators need to write like interesting bios about who they are and how they came to find yeah. each artist and how that in turn put ideas in their head. Because this is this is a load of schlock. Mm-hmm. The Biennial is a gathering of artists who explore the permeability of the relationships between mind and body, the fluidity of identity, and the growing precariousness of the natural and constructed worlds around us. Whether through subversive humor, (laughs) expressive abstraction, or non-Western forms of cosmological thinking... These artists demonstrate that there are pathways to be found, strategies of coping, and healing to be discovered, and ways to come together even in a fractured time. I'm pretty sure that just is the reason for art. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? But, but sure, if you mm-hmm. want to make this, this is like the everything bagel yeah. of an art show. <laughs> like, there, it's not like in, in art speak, I wouldn't say that this is like a cohesive mm-hmm idea I, I i think next year and, and i'm sure people from the whitney are listening to Obviously my generous riveted. take on this mm-hmm. and, and care about what what you know jerry gagosian thinks their next biennial should be about but 
maybe pick like the most simple, basic topic and like see what amazingness can come out out of of one thing. Like just go the opposite, Mm -hmm. like be reductive, like Mm -hmm. take everything out. One of my favorite artworks is by Walter De Maria. And it's just this like short essay called Meaningless Work. Mm -hmm. He just sat down one day and he wrote an essay about what it, what it means to do meaningless work. (laughs) Uh, Let me tell you, like I could, I could kind of quote a lot to you at this exact moment in it resonates with me it sticks with me I walk down the street and Mm -hmm. I think about it I'm like is that person doing art or are they doing meaningless work Mm -hmm. what is the difference between the two that's just an example that I think there needs to be a little bit of like uh, something reductive Mm -hmm. something if I dare say curated yeah because this doesn't sound curated it did feel a little thrown together with just these like punchy topics that they're trying to, I don't know, make accessible to everyone. And it's just, it didn't work. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see it. And I'm curious, maybe I'll like eat crow. And on next week I'll be like, Annie, Wait, I, loved, I it. loved it. It was so good. I'm, I'm not being critical of the show yet. What I'm being critical of is this crusade that anybody who follows my Instagram knows I've been on for a while recently, which is how outrageously offensive I find art speaks Mm -hmm. to be and how I think like, think about like interior design, think about dance, Mm -hmm. ballet, acting, good acting, like in fashion, they Mm -hmm. always say like, get ready Mm -hmm. and then look in the mirror and take one One thing thing off. off. Coco Chanel yes. said that. Yeah. Oh, is that you said it? Mm-hmm. Like, my God, with this press release, we could have yeah, taken, taken a few things a off. A few things off. Yeah. And made it just a little simpler because there's a newsflash to art institutions. There's nothing wrong with creating exhibitions where people understand what the fuck you're talking about. Yeah. Like, well, that goes back to my question. Like, who is this for? <laughs> I mean, you have a degree in art history. <laughs> I have I have seven years of art education. I and I go to a lot of these things, and I sometimes I don't know. I I'm gonna sound kind of whiny and babyish right now, but like I swear, I came to art as somebody who you know came from an extremely broken family, um, had a very hard childhood, um, where I needed to find a place to feel some level of hope and joy Mm -hmm. and live in a world where like everything wasn't about some of the literal pains and tortures that I was going through. Like, thank God for art. Like art saved my life. Mm -hmm. It's not a game for me. It is completely real. It is the healing medication that they they refer to actually in the Mm -hmm. press release for me it is healing but what is that like what is that healing Mm -hmm. I don't think that like the healing has to be every single exhibition has to be like screaming in your face Mm -hmm. about how much the world sucks right now yeah the healing medication can be laughter can be playfulness Mm -hmm. can be joy can be like hey let's look at images of an extremely beautiful garden with flowers Mm -hmm. in bloom while you listen to the sounds of the horrors going on and, and learn to like accept the beauty and the violence Mm -hmm. in the banality. Like these are okay things. And there's just, there's something on trend. It's like been the last, I don't know, 10 years Mm -hmm. where it's like, if the art isn't depressing, not good. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry if, like, if this is too much of a common, like, tasteless Mm -hmm. sentiment that I'm expressing for you, literally, I don't care. Unfollow me. You can criticize me. You can say anything you want. But, like, I'm never backing down from this Mm -hmm. because art is healing. Mm -hmm. It is magic. And it can make the world a better place. Yeah it has made my life livable and better in ways that only art could have done. Mm -hmm. And I'm never backing away from that. I can't wait to hear what kind of comments you get. (laughs) 
Anyway. Only lovely ones, of yeah, course. Sure. Yeah. Well, well, with that, with that, I guess we're wrapping up episode two. Yeah. So I want to say thank you to my co-host, Jerry. And I want to say thank you to our producer, Joe Tisdale. We love you, Joe. We love you, Joe. Thank you for all of your amazing edits where you make us more beautiful and we need funnier that. than we actually are. Thank you. We have a great interview with Bianca Bosker next week to talk about her book, Get the Picture. So we're really excited to have her on and we're excited for you guys to listen. So see you on the internet. See you on the internet. Bye.